That's embarrassing for somebody to get that emotional. I'm glad, I'm glad I hold it together all the time. In the early assembly, both of us got, had our moments, so God bless that brother um, and you, and this will be good. It's a good day. Uh, let me say this right up front. Uh, it's been a good day, and thanks to Andrew and Angela and all those, all those who put this together. Um, let me say it up front, because I won't say it later, and I sometimes say this at the very beginning. If you don't know Jesus, who is the Christ, then we want to tell you about that. I won't spend much time with that. I won't spend any more time with that, but that we would love to tell you that most of all. And if you don't know what he has done for you, his death on the cross, his burial in the tomb, his resurrection from the grave, we want to tell you that. And you can come talk to me or an elder or a deacon, but you can find anybody sitting right next to you who would They'd be honored to tell you about that. And our response to that in faith and repentance and baptism, we, we would love to tell you more of that story. So let us, if we could. Let me get to this. I, I want to give you three truths today, and I suspect you already know these and would say amen to these. So maybe these are reminders, but I'll say what maybe we all know. But let's spend some time with these. First, the Lord loves children values them and welcomes them into his circle. There's a sweet scene in the scriptures, in the, in the gospels, where uh, it, it, it is drawn with the, with the mind and the words of Jesus and the gospel writers, and then many have tried to paint it, what it must have looked like, but it's Jesus who sits there and he is uh, uh, welcoming children onto his lap and usually in the pictures smiling. It's beautiful. Uh, the reason that's significant is not just that uh, Jesus welcomed them, but that sometimes the disciples tried not to welcome them. Jesus has to rebuke his own disciples, saying, let the little children come to me. Uh, he could have left it there. It's compassionate enough just to say that. He doesn't want his disciples to get in the way of them, so let them come, and he could have left it right there. But it's, it, it's more of an invitation Come to me, and also a lesson for the disciples. Let the little children come to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these little ones. He's pointing to an insight into children and the kingdom. He's recognizing the value of children, and I'm not sure we understand the significance of it or the fullness of it. The kingdom, in the kingdom, in God's kingdom, what he likes, how he operates, what pleases him, what he values, what he recognizes and loves to see is partly children and those who are like children. We're going to focus on children today as we already have, and I know not that you're doing this, but some out there may be saying, are we talking about children again? Uh, are we focusing on the kids? Yes, we are. And okay to do that. It's great to do that. Jesus doesn't mind focusing on the kids either. There's something special about them, unique about them, cherished about them. And we grown-ups should more than take note of them. We should learn from them. I wonder what he's talking about when he says, such is the kingdom that belongs to such as these. I think I get it, but I wonder if I do. I've heard some smart people talk about that verse, and I've read some experts and what they've said about that verse. I wonder, though, if we have more to learn. There's something about a child. Maybe it's their perspective in life. Maybe it's their innocence and spirit and experience. Maybe it's their trusting and simple faith. Maybe it's their wonder and excitement. Who knows how much more there is to a child? But while we're thinking, boy, we really need to educate these children, so we're talking about educating children today, and we should pump them with scripture and knowledge and information about God. But while doing that, Jesus is pointing to something in them and saying to us, and you should be like them. D Jesus doesn't just say that to the disciples. He says it to all of us. He challenges us. Even Matthew 18, truly I tell you, unless you change, unless you adults change and become like them, you can't even get into the kingdom of heaven. So while we are wanting them to be more like us, Jesus shows us where we should be more like them too. 
Some folks don't love being around children, even their own children, and I have been guilty of that at times. At times. Jesus loves them as we sing and as we know. As the Scriptures tell us, it is so. In some ways, we should be more like them than like us. Now, the second truth is the Lord believes the first priority of parents and families is to teach their children about Him. So you come to Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, the Israelites have heard from the Lord, and He has said to them, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's the truth. And love the Lord. You should love the Lord with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength. That's it. That's what matters most. He is the center of truth, the beginning of knowledge, the foundation of everything. Wisdom is there. There's one God and only one God, and He deserves everything you are and everything you can give. He is worthy of your love and your devotion. So everything you have and own and dream of and plan and everything you love and everything you already are in love should be His and His alone. That's excellent, praiseworthy. It's right to know and to do, but there's one more level beyond that because He has a little bit more to say. Do you know what that is? The next step? Verse 6, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and also impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up and tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads and write them on the door frames of your home and on your gates. Our first job is to know the Lord and to love Him. And our second job is to make sure our children know it, him, and do the same in response. So parents, your job is to teach your children about the Lord. It's really not the church's first obligation, it's yours. If you're like me, though, you have been disappointed at how and how often you've done it. Uh, we try in our family at every meal to pray, and at bedtime with our youngest to pray, and sometimes before a trip we'll pray, and at other times we try to pray. We try in our family to be at church all the time, to make sure our kids are involved as much as they can be. We try to bring Scripture into our children's lives, reading to them or reminding them or going over, over the stories found in them. But if you ask our children, they can tell you how often we have failed in that. That's our goal, and you ought to be a preacher sometime. Let your wife tell you we should be doing that. That's embarrassing. We could do better. I bet you could too. So let's not beat ourselves up like we haven't done a great job. Of course we haven't, maybe, but we're trying, aren't you? Let's just put a little perspective on this. Gary Collins wrote these 10 truths for our families, and two of them are even good parents sometimes have rebellious kids. And also even bad parents sometimes have healthy and adjusted kids. None of us are perfect, and even the perfect father has imperfect children. This is not about guilt, what you have done or not done in the past. Can we let the past be the past? I'd like to leave it there, but no matter who you are and who you have in your home, no, no matter how you have done in the past, let, let's just make sure we do what Deuteronomy says and seize every moment to speak truth into the lives of our children or those that we have and tell them every time we can about the Lord. There is never a bad time to talk to your family about the Lord. I think that's what Deuteronomy is saying. There is never a bad time to talk to your family about the Lord. And for those who pour into their kids' lives and saturate them with the truths of God, it becomes obvious. And parents and grandparents, when they do more than just give the facts of life, but give the facts of God, and more than give the facts of God, but instill real, genuine faith in their children and grand, grand, grandchildren, then they find out the generations that come behind them are truly blessed because they can be changed and transformed and come to be like God and know God and love God. And when you see it happen, it's beautiful. Generation passing faith from one to the next to the next. Uh, the young man evangelist, the young evangelist Timothy, um, Paul reflected on him and where he came from and, and just told him, First, uh, 2 Timothy 1, I'm reminded, Timothy, of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and then in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you. 
Everyone who runs a relay knows the whole race can be won or lost in the transfer of the baton. And even those who work hard on the transfer sometimes drop it. But still, it's the practicing, the intentionality, the getting it right until it becomes natural is the thing to work on. And what an honor to f see the baton being passed. What an honor to be part of that passing of the baton, instilling faith in this generation, and then it goes on to the next generation. Uh, just here in this church, we've seen it just, just now. I've mean, asked the Costellos, and they can tell you the joy of that, as Bill and Patty have passed on faith to their son, Michael. And of course, Shauna had her own, but Michael and Shauna have passed it on to Brindley, and Brindley was just baptized on Thursday, and it's an honor to see it. It doesn't get any better than that. Acapella released a song, 1990 Rescue Album, that asked the question, came out hard saying, who's going to tell the child about Jesus? Who is going to tell the child about God? And the answer to that in the song, and the answer to that is in life is, it's me. Well, I believe, it says in the song, I believe it's my responsibility to tell the child about God. It's not my wife's job, it's mine. It's not my parents' job, it's mine. It's, not my, it's, it's my job. And I hope you feel that in your family and in your home, whether it is your children, grandchildren, or great-grandchildren. Who is going to tell the child about Jesus Christ? Which brings me to the third truth, too. In any local family of believers, the church, we should always be teaching all the children about Jesus. Because I don't know who has heard and who hasn't heard, so we'll keep saying it. It becomes a focus of what we do. That's why we have Sunday school and Bible classes and little lambs and all the other things we do. We want every opportunity to tell any child who shows up here or any child we know about Jesus. And as a church, as a family, as a body, we all do these different things. Somebody says, I can change a light bulb. I can't do much else, but I'll change a light bulb. Somebody else says, I'll mow the grass. I'll set up some chairs. Somebody says, I'll cook a meal. I'll call that person. I'll visit the hospital. I'll, I'll write a card. I don't mind teaching a class. Uh, we all do what we can do. The question is, what are you doing? Because you should find your place. You should do something. Don't worry about what it is. Just do something in there. I, I am not a computer guy. If, if you know me, you know that. I barely know how to turn my own computer on. Don't, don't let me work on your computer around here. If they ask me to cook a meal, don't eat the meal. You do not want the meal. But I don't mind standing up doing this. You say, I could never do this. Good, don't do this. You do what you do. Let's find a place to serve, and we all work together. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, the body working together. But at some point, somebody's got to do this job, which we're talking about today, teaching the children who is going to teach them. And God bless you if you have been teaching the children about God. I think of all those who have taught in the past, taught me, taught my girls, just my girls. Um, I, I started thinking in names, and I probably shouldn't do this, but I, I wonder how many babies Leslie Laws has taught. I, I started thinking in names I shouldn't have, but Diana Perryman, how many toddlers has she taught? Taught. Um, I started thinking of names, and I, I just I couldn't keep going. So put your name in there. Put your name in there. If you have taught my own girls, thank you. Robert Coleman tells a, a big influence in his life, a, a couple at the, the, the church where he was in the Sunday school, and he talks about this teen boys class, young teen boy class, and he said, despite our rather worldly concerns, Mrs. Anderson taught the Bible with keen insight to the moral issues we were facing and never let us forget the expectations of an infinitely holy God. She must have been good at that. And he doesn't talk uh, about the Mrs. only, talks about her husband. He said that the Andersons had no children of their own. But in a real sense, our class became their family. Mrs. Anderson cared for us was much the same affection as a mother. And if you have with motherly affection taught a child who wasn't even your own about Jesus, then God bless you for that. They lived in a modest home, he said. They lived for eternal values as their deeds would testify. And then he said he went away to college and Mr. Aunt, Mrs. Anderson gave him this little plaque on one side, just a picture of Jesus praying. And on the other side, prayer changes things. And on the back wrote, love Mrs. Anderson. They said, 
She was a teacher who had come from God. I've told you about the influences in my life if you've heard me talk. How many people have formed me? I can name some of the ladies, but not all of them. When I was a little kid, probably not the best student in our little class at our church in Troy, Illinois. I don't remember their lessons. I I probably couldn't tell you any of their lessons, but all of those ladies poured into my life. And they've made me who I am. Many people have taught me. Many people have shaped me. And I'm grateful for them, even if I can't name them. They did something incredible for me. And told me about Jesus. And kept telling me about Jesus. I do remember one lesson, and it wasn't a a woman. It was a man. He just died this month. And you won't know his name, Ray Hicks. But a big name to me. A big man. I've said this before, so maybe you've heard me, but I remember this lesson because he was trying to tell us we're blessed by God, we're rich. And I remember him saying, how many light bulbs? We were were arguing with him. We're not rich. You've seen my house. Have you seen our cars? And he said, how many light bulbs do you boys have? And I started thinking, how many light bulbs do I have? Do you know how many light bulbs you have? Start thinking of how many light bulbs, and now having been to Africa, seeing one hut with one light bulb hanging down, I can tell you we're rich, and Ray Hicks taught me that. I am blessed. I am blessed abundantly, and teachers have taught me that. I know some folks don't want to step into a classroom. They say, kill me first, torture me, but don't make me teach. I know, it's hard. It isn't easy, but still somebody's got to teach the children about Jesus. One man on his website wrote about his parenting issues and saying he wanted to take a more active role in his church for his son's sake. So he signed up to help in Sunday school, not as the main teacher, just a helper, and just pick the three to four-year-olds. I don't know what he was thinking. But got a wake-up call, didn't even show up the first Sunday. His kid set him straight, so he showed up the next week. He said there were three of us teachers slash helpers and 30 of them. And he writes, I was convinced beyond reasonable doubt that we could confidently handle the children, and I was wrong. (laughs) Sorry. I was wrong. No sooner had the teacher called us to order, some of the kids headed for the door. They wanted to get out of the classroom. I went up and locked the door. Well, that didn't help. Some started crying, wanted to go to their parents. Three boys are dragging the plastic chairs across the floor, screaming at the top of their voices. Two girls were running around the room, chasing one another, two boys fighting. In short, he said it was chaos. The teacher got everybody in a circle and started to sing Father Abraham, and that by that time, one boy had climbed up onto the window, was now swinging from it. Another had taken crayons and launched them across the room. One girl was crying, hit by another girl. Two other boys fighting over one toy, And then he says the most amazing thing was the way the teacher still remained calm, even as the chaos was happening in the room. I know this isn't a good ad for getting teachers, so sorry about that. But this is true, not in our classes, in other people's classes. He said by the time it was over, we were exhausted, the teachers, but he was impressed how he he and they eventually won over the trust of the kids. He went on to say, From that one single day of volunteering, I have developed a great respect for Sunday school teachers. And he says, next time you start to complain about things like down there, think again and offer your hand of support. Take time and honor those teachers who take care of your child. Dr. Justin Immel Sr. writes on his webpage about one of his professors, Mr. Overton. And he would always have this saying, I love what I'm doing because I don't know what I'm doing. I love what I'm doing because I, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and that's like teaching, he says. That's like teaching. You get in the classroom, you don't know what you're doing. But, but he says this, we never know what we're doing. We do not know what lives we are touching We do not know how many future generations may be taught the truth because you touch one heart and that student teaches his family the truth that you taught him. We do not know how many more souls may be in heaven because of the work that you do. The work in which you are engaged is some of the most important work in all the world. 
Some researcher may discover a cure for cancer, but you take your students to Jesus Christ, the cure for sin. The President of the United States may have power to sway the course of human history, but you hold up the power of the gospel, power that converts the souls of men. Teaching a child about the Lord may be the greatest honor there is. So God bless all of you who have or who are or who will do the great work of God in the life of a child because you and some like you have changed me and my family and who knows how many for eternity. God bless you for that. Let's stand and sing the song. Lord, the light of your love.